people don't know uh, about the history of, of African Americans. We have to know where we've been in order to know where we want to go. Having um, African Americans in the war changed the course of the Civil War for the North. There's a lot of pride to know where you come from. We can recommit ourselves to the movement for freedom and for justice. If you look at pictures of colonial Connecticut, you'll see English Puritan settlers. Perhaps you'll see an occasional Indian, but from the very start of the Connecticut colony, there were also people of a different origin here, Africans and people of African descent. African Americans in Connecticut have a little known history, both of oppression and of challenging oppression. To commemorate this hidden history, the state of Connecticut established the Connecticut Freedom Trail in 1996. The trail memorializes individuals and events that have advanced the struggle for freedom, justice, and equality. It has provided people throughout Connecticut with an opportunity to rediscover the largely forgotten experience of black people in this quintessentially Yankee state. This documentary recounts the history of Connecticut African Americans from colonial times to the Civil War and shows how people are rediscovering that history today. I was born at Dukandara in Guinea about the year 1729. My father's name was Sorghum Furo, prince of the tribe of Dukandara. I was about six years old that that place had been invaded by a numerous army instigated by some white nation who equipped and sent them to subdue and possess the country. I and other prisoners were rowed away to a vessel belonging to Rhode Island. I was brought on board by one Robertson Mumford for four gallons of rum and a piece of calico and called Venture on account of his having purchased me with his own private venture. My name is Andre Wormsley and this is my brother Travis Wormsley. We are ninth generation descendants of Venture Smith. In 1997, descendants of Venture Smith, as well as other community residents, gathered in East Haddam, Connecticut, where Venture Smith ultimately came to live for their first ever reunion. Venture Smith's story is known because he told it in the book, A Narrative of the Life and Adventures of Venture, a native of Africa, but resident above 60 years in the United States of America. In his early 20s, Venture tried to escape, but was betrayed. By the time he was 31, he had been sold three times. When permitted, he farmed, fished, and cut firewood, and ultimately saved enough to purchase his freedom. By the time he was 46, he had earned enough to redeem his wife, three children, and three other black men from slavery. Once free, he built a house on Haddam Neck, whose foundation and cellar hole can still be seen. At age 69, Venture wrote, I am now possessed of more than 100 acres of land and three habitable dwelling houses. My freedom is a privilege which nothing else can equal. First time my father told me about Venture Smith, as soon as he told me about his history and all the struggles that he had to deal with, I went straight to like a globe or a, or a map and I looked up Guinea West Africa and I just wanted to see where he was, you know? I compare like his struggles to what I have to do, you know? Uh, struggles in school, football, life, and and see how, thinking about how he would deal with them. And because uh, his struggle is m far more complex than mine. Venture Smith, his wife Margaret, and other family members are buried next to the first Church of Christ, which he probably helped to build in 1794. The first slaves in Connecticut were Pequot Indians, captured in the Pequot War of 1636 through 1637. 
Some were sent to Massachusetts in exchange for slaves of African descent. About 2% of the Connecticut colonist population were blacks, mostly slaves, who worked as servants or farm laborers living in their owners' households. Traditions of African life and culture lived on among Connecticut blacks. Although many lived quite a distance from other black neighbors, they found ways to build and sustain the idea of a black community. Imported Africans in 18th century New England celebrated their heritage with informal festivals in honor of community leaders who were often royal. This holiday became a formal election of black kings and governors as slaves and free blacks accompanied whites who went to town for the colonial elections. In regions of Connecticut, this festival that borrowed from Africa and parodied white New England was becoming tradition by 1760. In a letter, Civil War veteran and diplomat Ebenezer Bassett remembered his father's election as Negro governor of Connecticut. My father was mulatto, born in the family of Squire Bassett of Derby. He inherited somewhat more than his father's natural intelligence and was the very finest physical mold. It was altogether natural that he should be brought forward and elected one of the so-called Negro governors of Connecticut. In the institution of the black governors and kings, what we find is a carryover because the governors and kings of the black community had ceremonial roles, they had legal roles, they had the same sort of roles that a chief would have in West Africa. So it's a very interesting situation because it's um, an instance of self-determination even in the midst of slavery. As the American Revolution approached, a few Connecticut citizens began to raise their voices against slavery. A letter published in the Norwich Packet criticized the revolutionary patriotic organization, the Sons of Liberty, for demanding freedom for the American colonies while tolerating slavery for blacks. We that declare, and that with much warmth and zeal, it is unjust cruel, barbarous, unconstitutional, and without law to enslave. Do we enslave? Yes, verily we do. Can we expect to be free so long as we are determined to enslave? Evidence suggests that there was between 300 and 400 African Americans that served in Connecticut either for the Continental Army or for the state uh, militia. Some of the African Americans were slaves who had no promise of freedom, but served anyway. Some were already free as free men and joined. And then a number of them were slaves who were promised their freedom once the uh, war was over. One of Connecticut's black Revolutionary War soldiers was Nero Hawley, a slave in the household of Daniel Hawley in what is today Trumbull, Connecticut. In 1777, the 36-year-old Nero Hawley joined the Continental Army to support the colonies in the American Revolution. Nero Hawley served with George Washington at Valley Forge. Hawley served four years and in 1781 returned to his wife and family. After he was discharged from the Army, uh, a year later he was given his freedom by his owner and then uh, he had a, a number of skills and he used those skills first to build himself a house in town and then he went into the brick making business. One of the Revolutionary War's fiercest battles took place at Fort Griswold in Groton on September 6, 1781. A militia including our two black uh, soldiers had come from their nearby homes uh, into the fort. Latham and Jordan Freeman both uh, had no need to serve because blacks were not required to serve in the militia. And he and Latham uh, lost their lives, uh, so ironically, of course, fighting for the freedom of uh, white people, not for the freedom of blacks. The participation of blacks in the Revolutionary War posed the question of whether or not they were entitled to liberty and equality. Jeremiah Asher, a black leader in 19th century Hartford, recalled the discussions of his grandfather and other black veterans 
of the Revolutionary War. I was so accustomed to hear these men talk until I almost fancied to myself that I had more rights than any white man in the town. I confess that the result of their teachings gave my parents much trouble. For whenever I was insulted, I would resist it. Neither my father nor my mother could persuade me that white boys were allowed to insult me because I was colored. I invariably felt justified in defending myself. In 1784, Connecticut passed a law providing for the gradual emancipation of slaves. So gradual that slavery was not totally abolished until more than 60 years later. The law provided that the children of slaves would themselves be slaves, but must be freed when they reached the age of 25. James Mars was born a slave in Connecticut in 1790. He and his family were owned by the Congregational Minister of Canaan. When James was eight, Reverend Thompson threatened to take the family to the South. James's father, Jupiter Mars, instead put his family in a wagon and fled to the nearby town of Norfolk. We stopped at a tavern kept by Mr. G. Pettibone, and in him, we found a friend. Over the course of several months, at least 10 different Norfolk families hid James and his family. We saw 14 men on horseback. They were men we knew. The parson was one of them. We hid behind a log that was near us until they got out of sight. We then went into the woods, and there we found my mother and sister. Very soon, the thought of night came to mind. How we were to spend the night, and what we should do for something to eat. But between sundown and dark, a man passed along by the edge of the woods, whistling as he went. After he had passed on, father went up where the man went along and came back with a pail, and in it was our supper. After months of stalemate, Reverend Thompson agreed to free most of the family members and to sell eight-year-old James and his brother to a master of their parents' choosing. Fortunately, James's family was able to settle nearby his new owner. James was freed in his early 20s, bought land in Norfolk, and eventually moved to Hartford, where he became a leader in the black community. As slavery declined in Connecticut, blacks increasingly relocated from rural farmsteads to major cities like Hartford, Bridgeport, and New Haven where they began to form their own community institutions. Well, before the Civil War, um, uh, the institutions that um, grew within the black community, uh, for the most part, grew around the church. They were mutual aid sorts of societies. Jeremiah Asher was the grandson of a slave who fought in the American Revolution and who thereby gained his freedom. When Jeremiah Asher moved to Hartford, he was unhappy to find that the church where he worshiped was segregated. Many Hartford blacks objected to the segregation of their churches, and in 1819, they began to organize. After meeting weekly for a year with a black minister, the emerging black congregation organized a Sunday school for children of color. Six years later, they decided to establish their own house of worship. We, the undersigned, desirous of enjoying this privilege as a distinct people and preparing the way for others of our depressed nation to enjoy like blessings, do hereby form the African Religious Society of Hartford. Several of Hartford's black churches can trace their roots to the African Religious Society. One of them was the Colored Congregational Church, today's Faith Congregational Church. We are coming to celebrate and to honor that much of the black history of the United States has a part here in the New England area and in Connecticut in particular. And the Freedom Trail is, is an uh, opportunity for us to look within our own communities and trace some of the rich heritage that we have here. This time we want to present to you a short little presentation on one of the greatest persons of our history, James W.C. Pennington 
pastor of this great church, but also a fighter for freedom. In 1841, with the help of the good Lord, I completed writing the first history of the Negro in America. While in Germany, I was presented with the honorary degree of Doctor of Divinity, the first given to a black man by the University of Heidelberg. Pennington's church opened Hartford's first school for black children. Education was a must. We preached education. We talked it. We encouraged the children. The very important author was Ann Plato, and she was born and raised in Hartford, and she published a book of essays during a time in which uh, women writers were scarce, to say the least, and African-American women writers were non-existent. She was one of the first school teachers at the African school, which was at Talcott Street. So she was a very important part of her community, but also she was uh, a symbol of the importance of education within the community and how much it was esteemed. Another leading member of the church was Rebecca Primus, Rebecca Primus uh, was born into a fairly prominent Hartford family, black Hartford family. In November 1865, Rebecca Primus, sponsored by the Hartford Freedmen's Aid Society, goes to the eastern shore of Maryland, where she begins to teach children of the freedmen. And she raises money to build a school there, and they name the school after her, the Primus Institute. And personally, it was very important for me to become involved in bringing Rebecca's life to the forefront um, and bringing her, making her accessible to people who didn't know about her because I wanted to show that there was a tradition of black women who were committed, who were dedicated. Rebecca Primus was a school teacher. I happened to be a teacher as well. And the work that she did had an impact far beyond what happened in that classroom. Churches played a central role in the formation of black communities in other Connecticut cities. Generally, we view the black church as being a very, very important institution in the history of blacks in the United States. And I think you can see that in the development of Dixwell Avenue Church here in, in New Haven. This is my church home. And way back to my grandmother, we have been proud to be members of a congregation which started out with this kind of history. My real experience, once I understood what, was, what this church was about, began as a college student. The minister here, Dr. Edmonds, encouraged me to go south. And as a college student, I ended in, up in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1960 and became another freedom fighter from New Haven to the South in the sit-ins and opening up the um, public facilities and the five and ten cent stores, the, the lunch counters and so forth. So I feel a real part of history here. Little Liberia was first formed in the mid-1800s in Bridgeport. The interesting thing about Little Liberia is that the land that was sold to the residents was actually property that was transferred by white citizens because they very much wanted to prove that blacks could own property and maintain property and therefore be a part of the United States. As time went by, the area grew. It had two churches, 150 people, and 70 homes. And one of the churches in Little Liberia is the Walter A. M. Meese Church, which is still functioning in Bridgeport today. First of all, let me thank all of you for coming and participating in this uh, Freedom Trail activity. Well, it's always free to know your heritage, you know where you came from, as well as where you're going. Connecticut's black churches became centers of the struggle for equal rights. In 1847, for example, Reverend Amos Beeman of New Haven's Temple Street Church, Reverend James Pennington of Hartford's Talcott Street Church, and others appealed to voters to provide equal voting rights for blacks by taking the word white out of the Constitution. We are your fellow citizens, native born, and with you, we must live and die. 
We do not wish to be pointed at as a degraded class in the community. Neither do we believe that the color of the skin is any indication either of virtue, wisdom, or justice. But we regard it as a physical manifestation for which an all-wise creator is alone responsible. Despite its eloquence, Connecticut's white voters rejected this appeal. When Herman Melville's fictional whaling ship, the Pequot, set off to hunt Moby Dick, about half the crew were blacks, American Indians, Cape Verdeans, Azorians, Maoris, and other South Sea Islanders, Eskimos, and others of non-European ancestry. The same was true of the Charles W. Morgan, the last of the once great fleet of 19th century wooden whaling ships, which is now docked on the grounds of Mystic Seaport. The Charles W. Morgan is not only a key element of visitors' experience here, but it's part of the Connecticut Freedom Trail. And when you go aboard, you'll understand how African Americans saw an opportunity serving on a ship like this. It was a hard life, but it was perhaps a better life and a better opportunity than they found ashore. Whaling was one of the places where African Americans could advance and become officers, captains, and even owners. That didn't happen in very many other trades, but it, it happened in whaling. As the visitor travels around the museum, they'll find the African-American story woven through, just as it is woven through our history. We'll soon be sailing on blue water, shallow, shallow around the black... During the American Revolution, Connecticut couldn't get enough soldiers or Navy people or Marines to actually fight the war. So what they did at the time was they invited blacks to come and serve on the vessels. Blacks then, after the American Revolution, continued to work as free men now. Some were still enslaved, but the market was then open for people to actually work in exchange for wages. As time went on in the 1840s, you began to see labor coming in from Ireland and places in Southern Europe. At this point, people preferred to pay whites instead of paying blacks and black seamen began to lose their job. And this is when you especially saw a lot of blacks turn to whaling. No Americans made the sacrifice that African Americans did. No Americans worked for centuries for no pay. No Americans had to sacrifice their life, their body, their children for nothing in return in order to build this nation. Going to sea was a way for black men to actually be men. They could earn at a time when blacks, both freed and enslaved, were blocked from competing as equals in the market economy. And if you came here with nothing on your back and you didn't speak English, you had something that the black man who came in the 1600s didn't have, you had a chance. Connecticut African Americans played other important economic roles in the era before the Civil War. One example was William Lanson of New Haven. I feel it my duty to notify the public of my prosperity in life. I built the biggest part of the East Haven Bridge and the Steamboat Wharfs and most of all the wharfs and slips up to the head of Long Wharf. Certainly he was one of, if not the uh, wealthiest black man in the state of Connecticut in the 19th century. Lanson was an entrepreneur, he was a contractor, uh, he owned a hotel, um, he uh, did a kind of shipping business. I mean, he was also uh, a subcontractor. We have records of him working on the uh, Arlington Canal project, for instance. Uh, and employing other free blacks. Long Wharf played an important role in the port of New Haven and remains a landmark today. 
Nelson Primus, the brother of Rebecca Primus, uh, was active here in Hartford as a painter of portraits. And as an artist of the period, he certainly was active, um, uh, presenting him, his work for exhibition. But it, it simply wasn't enough, and, and I would have to surmise that this certainly is very typical of the uh, situation for not only Primus, but uh, African-American artists of the period. Eventually, Primus left Boston for San Francisco, where he found more regular commissions, but continued to struggle for recognition and acceptance as an artist. I think what we're, we're seeing as a nation is that African American artists are so much a part of what we define as American culture, and it's wonderful to be able to look back and to celebrate that culture, knowing that we were full participants in it. Hannah Gray lived in New Haven in the early 1800s and worked as a laundress and seamstress. She played an active role in New Haven's abolitionist movement, and when she died in 1861, she left her small house as a home for indigent colored females. The Hannah Gray home continued to serve that function at the original and the subsequent site for more than 100 years. The Hannah Gray story is just a fascinating one. She even gave some of her earnings to help Yale students pay their uh, tuition to attend the Yale Divinity School. And in some of the old records, uh, even the president of Yale was a friend. I mean, where she gave her house to her two friends and left the stipulation that it would become a home for the aged. And I believe it was the first in New England when the schoolmistress Prudence Crandall agreed to open a school for young ladies in Canterbury, Connecticut in 1831, the prominent citizens of the community were delighted. But all that changed when Prudence Crandall admitted a young lady of color as a student in a school. In the early 1830s, there was virtually no type of educational process for African Americans. There was the local district schools where Afri African Americans were allowed to uh, attend, but some evidence indicates they weren't fairly treated. Prudence Crandall was the first one that we can see who really attempted to establish a type of, um, of a curriculum that went beyond what you could learn in the district school. As Prudence Crandall told it, the story began when she became friends with a young black woman from the Jail Hill section of Norwich. Sarah Harris, Prudence Crandall's first black student, was born in Norwich and raised not far from where we're standing. What's interesting to us is that this family that came from Norwich and that lived here on Jail Hill uh, was very much involved with Prudence Crandall in this whole uh, school thing. Her brother was courting a black servant in Prudence Crandall's household. I allowed her to enter as one of my pupils. By this act, I gave great offense. I very soon found that some of my school would leave, not to return, if the colored girl was retained. Sarah Harris knew about the type of education that the students were receiving here at the school. She hoped that if she could in turn eventually receive this education and then go back into the black community of Norwich, that she would be able to fulfill an ambition that she had herself of becoming a teacher. Faced with the threat that white parents would withdraw their children from her school, Prudence decided to reopen it as a school for young ladies and misses of color. Canterbury reacted to this news with shock. A town meeting with over 1,000 angry townspeople condemned the project. Soon after the town meeting, 15 or so black children arrived and began to study at Crandall's school. Crandall's antagonists next persuaded the state legislature to pass what came to be known as the Black Law, restricting the education of blacks. Crandall decided to defy the law, thereby forcing those who arrested her to lock her up in jail overnight. Crandall's opponents eventually lost in court, but on a narrow technicality that left unresolved the issue of black rights that Crandall had hoped to test. Crandall's opponents then escalated their violence, 
A group of unknown men silently surrounded the school at night with clubs and iron bars. With a deafening noise, they attacked, scarring the walls, bursting open the doors, and breaking 90 panes of glass. Crandall finally decided to close the school and leave Canterbury. The incident caused many to examine their consciences. The movement against slavery grew rapidly in the Canterbury area as elsewhere in the succeeding years. Public opinion came to regard the hostility to her school and the racial attitudes it revealed with shame. I look upon the students as, as being courageous as well. And after the school ended, we know on s information on several of them that they went into teaching. Some got married and their children became teachers uh, in New Haven, over in Rhode Island, and some down in the South when the Civil War ended and uh, freedmen schools were begun. In 1995, Prudence Crandall was designated as Connecticut's state heroine. Her school building is now a museum. And we thought that it would be a good idea to get on their Freedom Trail and actually visit some of those sites. And with that, we get more of our history of what the African Americans were doing in Connecticut. And an idea as to where our history in Waterbury fits into the history of the, the whole state. Mm -hmm. Well, whenever I hear about something like this, then I'll make time to um, bring him along so something that he could learn about you know it's not always that easy you know by me working and everything but I know in advance something like this this educational that's going to benefit him is coming along then I'll just take that time off to make sure I bring him because this side went up in 1678 I'm from born and raised in Waterbury and I never got any part of any type of black history that I thought was significant to, to make me really know where I'm from, you know, just, just who my ancestors are. The day has been a wonderful educational treat, and I feel so strongly that this should be open not only just to African Americans, but to every citizen, so that we all know uh, the past, and hopefully some of the things that were done in the past will never be done again. The Underground Railroad was a network of safe houses and anti-slavery activists who helped fugitive slaves escape to freedom. It had branches throughout Connecticut. One branch went through Norwich. The amount that we actually know about the Underground Railroad in Norwich is, as a certainty, is very, very little. The difficulty was that participating in it was highly illegal. And the way it seems to have worked was fugitives made their way to New York, where they would then normally be given uh, steamboat tickets by the New York Vigilance Committee, who were the uh, main Underground Railroad folks in New York. They would take a steamboat relatively openly to Norwich or to one of the other ports along the Sound, and then get off there and then make contact with people in town. And it really seems that much of the Underground Railroad was actually free black members of the community helping escape slaves. James Lindsay Smith was a slave in Virginia who escaped north in 1838. In Philadelphia, he asked a black shoemaker named Simpson for work and disclosed that he was a runaway slave. Next day, a number of abolitionists came to see him. They held a meeting that day and decided to send me to Springfield, Massachusetts. The next day, Simpson took me down to the steamboat and started me for New York, giving me a letter directed to David Ruggles. He found Ruggles, a native of Norwich, Connecticut, who put him on a steamer to Hartford with a letter to a Mr. Foster there. I saw a colored man standing and seemed to be looking at me. I went up to him and asked him if he knew a man by the name of Foster. He replied, yes. So he went along with me, and I found Mr. Foster's residence, and finding him at home, I presented the letter. After he had read it, he began to congratulate me on my escape. 
he went out among the friends. Many of them came in to see me and received me cordially. I began to realize that I had some friends. James Lindsay Smith became an active abolitionist, lecturing throughout southern New England. He eventually settled in Norwich, where he worked as a shoemaker and as a pastor of a Methodist church. He bought a house which still stands today in the Jail Hill section. It was the home that James Lindsay uh, Smith um, purchased uh, about 1845. And what we're going to try to do in the next few months is to restart the Jail Hill Neighborhood Association. It goes back to uh, a period in African American history and American history, which admittedly is not a pleasant one, but is essential to the understanding of not only the country, but my people, African American people, as a people, the incredible amount of strength and courage and perseverance they had to have to have my home be a part of that kind of historical event and that period in time is very important to me because history is very important. We have to know where we've been in order to know where we want to go. In 1839, a group of Africans were captured, sold, and shipped to Cuba. In Havana, 53 of them were sold and sent on the ship, the Amistad, to their purchasers' plantations. On the way, they revolted, seized the ship, killed captain and crew, and ordered the surviving Spaniards to sail toward the rising sun, back to Africa. The Spaniards secretly turned the ship around at night and eventually landed in Long Island Sound, where the ship was captured by a United States government vessel and towed to New London. The Africans were charged with murder and mutiny and locked up in the New Haven jail. But Connecticut abolitionists immediately came to their defense, hired lawyers to defend them in court, and found a translator through whom they could tell their story. Their case was argued before the Supreme Court of the United States by former President John Quincy Adams. The Supreme Court ruled that the Africans were entitled to their liberty like any other freeborn human beings and should be free to go wherever they wished. The court said they had exercised an ultimate right. The ultimate right of all human beings in extreme cases to resist oppression and to apply force against ruinous injustice. The former captives, now free, moved to Farmington. With the help of their abolitionist supporters, they raised money and chartered a ship to return home. As they reached the coast of Sierra Leone, their leader, Senke, wrote an American supporter. I thank all American people for they send many people home. I shall never forget American people. Your friend, Sinke. The United Church of Christ recognizes the importance of the Amistad story for all of us. And it has issued this litany to all of the United Church of Christ churches in the United States. God of hope, we thank you for the Amistad legacy that lives on in the work of the church and the people of the church committed to evangelism, education, prophetic service, action, and justice. It is our story. It's a story that takes place, took place here, and by God's grace will continue to take place here into the future. People come in and they have, there is a feeling, it's almost like a bonding with the church. I see it when we have guests here from Sierra Leone or from Washington or from the UN. They have a hard time leaving. The Amistad story, long almost forgotten, has finally begun to receive some of the attention it deserves. A century and a half after the Amistad captives liberation, a statue honoring them was erected in front of New Haven City Hall. The Amistad story has also been the basis for a major motion picture by Steven Spielberg and an opera produced by the Chicago Lyric Opera. A reproduction of the ship Amistad is being built to serve as a focus 
for educational activities on human rights and the struggle against slavery. Well, the idea of building the vessel has been around since the mid-70s, and this is its first coming to fruition. And therefore, uh, a tremendous number of people from all around the country uh, who have had an interest in Amistad for many years are all coming together to see that happen. And after today, the building of this vessel will start. So the dream now is a reality. And for many of us who have put a lot of work, sweat, and tears into this, for us, it's very emotional. Today's event is, is the beginning, I think, of the end of racism in America. And we're very glad that the people of Sierra Leone, the Federico captives, were able to found a very good alliance with the people of the United States. And so it's most appropriate that we gather at a key land to lay the heart of this vessel, to begin the process, if you will, of ending the destructive silences when it comes to race. And so these 60 souls are represented today. Before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. And they struck out for freedom and for life. And steadily, he, he too, slowly, steadily, he too, he too, he too, he too. He too. Uh, the spirit, the, the, the excitement in the room. It's more than a moving of a piece of wood. It's a spiritual gathering. That piece of wood now has been blessed. I, I wanted to, to build the Armistad, but what I really wanted to do, which would help me, I sort of think, get on it, would be to sail on it in the year 2000 when it's all built. It's a part of my history, and just to be, just to be on something that I helped kind of build, and because not everyone will be able to do this. That's that's just a dream for me. I want to go on it. That's that's just what I want to do. Only a minority of Connecticut whites were outspoken opponents of slavery, but some of them made an historic impact. In 1852, Connecticut author Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin which was directed against the brutality and injustice of slavery. The book sold hundreds of thousands of copies by the end of the next year and had a huge effect on public opinion regarding slavery. Stowe was born in Litchfield and spent much of her life in Hartford. The impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin and Harriet Beecher Stowe's other anti-slavery writing was so great that when Abraham Lincoln first met her, he is reported to have said, So, you are the little woman who wrote the book that made this great war. John Brown was born in 1800 in Torrington, Connecticut. In the tradition of his father, he was a staunch abolitionist. In 1859, he mounted an ambitious plan to f ferment a slave rebellion, incite guerrilla warfare, and liberate as many slaves as possible in Virginia. Brown and 18 followers attacked the arsenal and armory at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. After holding the place for two days, Brown and his men were overrun by US Marines under the command of Robert E. Lee. Brown and the few other survivors were promptly put on trial for treason and were executed. Before his death sentence was pronounced, John Brown addressed the court regarding what he referred to as his interference with slavery. Had I so interfered in behalf of the rich, the powerful, the intelligent, the so-called great, and suffered and sacrificed what I have in this interference, it would have been all right. Every man in this court would have deemed it an act worthy of reward rather than punishment. I am yet too young to understand that God is any respecter of persons. 
Now, I believe that to have interfered as I have done in behalf of his despised poor, I did no wrong, but right. Amazing grace. Carrington residents held the dedication ceremony when John Brown's birthplace was placed on the Freedom Trail. Peter Brown came over on the Mayflower, I guess, and it um, must be like a great-grandfather or something of John Brown, and I'm a distant cousin to Peter Brown, and which is kind of ironic how this would all happen, and then years later, I would be one that was able to take care of the site. Perhaps that is why we each are here, that we won't just leave this site and think of it as a tourist attraction, but we will leave this site perhaps with a candle that we will take back to our homes and take back to our jobs and take back to the various ministries that we've each been given, that perhaps the spirit and the legacy of John Brown will last and his living will not be in vain. God bless you all. John Brown's attack at Harper's Ferry greatly alarmed slaveholders in the South, who soon after began discussing secession from the United States. From the outbreak of the Civil War, Connecticut African Americans had pushed for the creation of black military units. Joseph Shelton, a white anti-slavery activist and member of the Underground Railroad, wrote to Governor Buckingham that blacks in Bridgeport, Hartford, and New Haven wanted to form military drill units. Buckingham refused. The time may yet come when a regiment of colored men may be profitably employed, but now it would create so much unpleasant feeling and irritation that more evil than good would result. So Shelton and a group of Connecticut blacks created their own secret military organization. All persons held as slaves within any state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. Abraham Lincoln's 1863 Emancipation Proclamation turned the Civil War into a war against slavery. In its wake, the U.S. government authorized Massachusetts to organize a regiment of volunteers of African descent. Having um, African Americans in the war changed the course of the Civil War for the North. The North was running short of men to fight and they ended up enlisting nearly 200,000 blacks by the time that they were done. Blacks from around the Berkshires flocked to Pittsfield to enlist in the new 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. Among the first of them, indeed one of the first Civil War volunteers in the nation, was Milo J. Freeland. Milo Freeland is now buried in North Canaan, Connecticut. When I was a kid, uh, walking my dog in the, the local graveyard, which was just down the street from my house, I came across this, this stone, which was at that time intact. To, to find a stone that was of the first black man enlisted in the North in the Rebellion of 1861 was, was quite astonishing, actually. After seeing the movie Glory, uh, I realized that that uh, Milo Freeland wasn't included in the story. Clearly, Milo Freeland had a role in local community history that wasn't being recognized. So my whole goal was to try to draw Milo Freeland into the, to the memory, uh, back into the memory of the local community. What I did was I funded half of the replacement of the stone, and they raised the rest of the money and, and took care of the ceremony. After Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, Connecticut, like Massachusetts, started to raise a black regiment. Well, Connecticut uh, formed its own unit made up of African Americans for the Civil War uh, in late 1863. Massachusetts had formed the 54th Regiment, and there was pressure on Governor William uh, uh, Buckingham, governor of Connecticut, to form an all-black unit. So in the fall of 1863, the uh, recruitment began for what became the 29th Regiment. Alexander Newton, son of a freed slave, was one of those who enlisted in the 29th Regiment. 
all the soldiers of the 29th Regiment, although dark-skinned, felt the full responsibility of their mission. We had the same muscle, the same strength, the same heart, the same conscience as the white man. We were fighting under the same flag and the same God. Supporters of black rights believed the participation of blacks in military service would transform the way they were viewed by whites. Augustus Brandegee, a U.S. congressman from New London and an active abolitionist, wrote, The conduct of a Negro regiment on the field would do more than all our pulpits toward dispelling the unchristian and inhuman prejudices which still exist against the race in this state. Yet even while black soldiers from Connecticut were fighting in the Union Army, Connecticut voters turned down an amendment to the state constitution to give black men the right to vote, a right they would only acquire five years later under the 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution. About 200,000 African Americans fought in the Civil War. More than a third of them were killed or wounded. Black veterans of the Civil War are buried in cemeteries in Middletown, Hartford, and other Connecticut cities. Well, it all started when Dean Nelson drafted me into doing a shoot for the African American Freedom Trail back in February. I'm asked to do this uh, quite a bit now. When I went to Thurman Milner School in Hartford, one of my old teachers was there, and he's the principal now, and he says to the students, Kevin was one of my students, and now here he is coming to the school where I'm principal at and sharing with my students. That touched me. That was special. Negro fighting brave, gallantly? Wow! But doing something like this and knowing that the African American wasn't just a slave and didn't just want to be a slave, this shows a different side of him, that he was brave, that he was courageous, that he also wanted to be free. And I say again, freedom. It sounds good. It sounds nice. Determined to march in the 1997 Freedom Trail Parade, a group of Connecticut citizens formed the descendants of the 29th Colored Troops. So we marched in that Freedom Trail Parade. And from that, you know, on the way back, we discussed, you know what, we need to do more than this. We ought to build an organization. The necessity of getting more and more of our history out into this community to um, broaden everyone's understanding of our role in the Civil War this kind of information is so significant. When we found out after we started our organization that there was an effort going on in Washington, D.C. to commemorate a monument to the United States Colored Troops that fought in the Civil War. And we says, wow, this is right down our alley. You know, we're, that's what we're all about. And uh, to be there to witness it, it was like the coming of the Messiah. People could not get close enough to that monument. People were reaching out and just had to touch it. For decades, Connecticut African Americans celebrated the abolition of slavery. The 1870 Jubilee celebration came 22 years after uh, all of the slaves in, in Connecticut were freed and seven years after the Emancipation Proclamation. The planning was done mostly by a church-based uh, black elite. The parade route was basically planned to march through the business district and through the wealthy communities of white New Haven. It was definitely a display of black New Haven for black New Haven, but it was also looking to white New Haven and saying we are a legitimate, cohesive, organized, free community that needs to be recognized as part of New Haven. In the past, when we studied the history of the United States and of the state, we always looked at whites as having built this society. If we're going to go forward into the next century, into the next millennium, as, as a united body of people, then we need to recognize the contributions that everyone made.
they just touch here and there one month out of a year you know dealing with black history but there is so much more well I'm a strong advocate of an, on education and I believe in history and I also believe that if we do not know our history we will repeat it he's 13 I have a two-year-old and I want better for them than what I see right now so hopefully if I can make a change by really educating them whether I'm here or gone he will survive People don't know uh, about the history of, of African Americans. And they come to Connecticut and they just think, well, that's just another place where people live. But when they find out that it goes way back into the 1700s and that we had African Americans living in Norwich and they built their own homes and uh, had their own businesses, I think it does a lot, especially for our young people today, to know that they can go way back into their history and see that African Americans have really made a contribution to uh, American society. There's a lot of pride to know where you come from and and you know it's it's a real privilege because not a lot of people know their heritage there has been a history and to know let them feel that they can be a part of that to move us into the future because without a sense of the past they cannot build on something for the future and i thought it was very important at this age for her to appreciate and know who she is and you know just really sort of feel proud about who she is. And that there are significant contributions throughout the state, throughout the, the country, and we ought to visit them from time to time. And I believe by doing that, that that helps to eliminate misunderstandings, cuts down on a discrimination, and reminds us that there's more that unites us than divides us. One of the uh, things that was an important contribution that Connecticut made to the Civil Rights Movement was that in terms of the uh, abolitionists and that whole tradition of resistance to oppressive conditions and resistance to legal segregation and legal second-class citizenship, we can trace that largely back to people such as Pennington as well as Mars because the civil rights movement in the modern era didn't just come from nowhere. There has always been a tradition. As a part of our continuing exploration of Connecticut's African-American experience, Connecticut Public Television and the Connecticut Humanities Council will soon present a sequel bringing the story of black Connecticut up to the present day. When you look for the most compelling programs on Connecticut's history and culture, you turn to CPTV. And thanks to our partners, the Connecticut Humanities Council, the Connecticut Experience Series has produced the most important programs in our history. Winner of five Emmy Awards and two prestigious Cine Golden Eagles, the Connecticut